This is for the ethics review class at Parker University. The sixth rule prohibits insurance fraud. The rule starts off deceptively simple. I'm sure it comes as no surprise that the Texas legislature in the Texas Chiropractic Act told the board to strictly and vigorously enforce the provisions of the chapter prohibiting fraud and that in its regulations the board adopted a rule that it takes a strong position against any form of health care fraud. What makes this rule deceptive is that when anyone is asked, are you in favor of insurance fraud, everybody will say no. Everybody is opposed to fraud. What makes the rule difficult is deciding what we mean by fraud and how broad it is. I think some doctors get themselves in trouble because they do not understand how broadly the board and the government interpret insurance fraud. And because of that, they innocently engage in practices that wind up subjecting them to criminal liability and subject them to losing their license. So let's talk about what is fraud. Some of the rules are pretty obvious and I don't don't think anybody violates these rules by accident or, or unintentionally. Uh, billing for services or goods that were not provided is fraud. Uh, billing for services that were medically or clinically unnecessary is fraud. Now the statute in Texas is pretty clear that this is not intended to include uh, unknowing or isolated billing errors. But on the other hand, any intentional act uh, certainly uh, can be fraud. And typically the cases that are being prosecuted are prosecuted because there is a pattern or a practice that has affected hundreds if not thousands of claims with uh, upcoding or billing for services that weren't provided or billing for services without documenting the clinical necessity for the services. The regulations adopted by the Texas Board mirror or reflect those requirements in the statute. Uh, they have the right to discipline chiropractors for grossly unprofessional conduct, which includes billing for services that are clearly excessive or billing for services that were not actually rendered. Typically, it's easy to figure out whether a service was actually rendered. Sometimes there can be a question about services were necessary or were excessive. My recommendation on that is to keep good documentation that reflects the exams being performed on the patient, reflects the thought process of the doctor in deciding what care to provide, and also reflects the doctor's concern and reevaluation of the treatment being provided from time to time especially if the patient is not responding as expected. The doctor should be reevaluating and communicating with the patient about whether the services are still necessary or whether they're simply not doing any good or not doing as much good as they should be doing. Fraud also includes kickbacks. Essentially, it is illegal to pay for securing a patient. That includes payments to other doctors, includes payments to the patient themselves, includes patient payments to other referral services. The statute in Texas is about as broad as it can be. A person commits an offense if the person knowingly offers to pay or agrees to accept directly or indirectly, overtly or covertly, any remuneration in cash or in kind to or from another for securing or soliciting a patient. There is also a Texas statute which has essentially the same language as this statute. The federal statute applies only to the Medicare, Medicaid, and other federal government programs. It does not apply to private health insurance. It does not apply for cash patients. The federal government has devoted some resources and has the attorneys and, and services in place to prosecute for violations of the kickback statute. Now the Texas statute, the state statute is broader 
than the federal statute because the federal statute is limited to the federal programs, but this statute would apply to any program or any patient, whether it's provided or covered by insurance or not, even a cash patient would be covered under this, this Texas statute. Unfortunately, the state government and the counties have almost no history of enforcing this statute. Sometimes it can be difficult to prove what the intent was behind the payment. It may be easy to show that something of value changed hands, but it may be more difficult to prove that the reason it changed hands was to help the person secure or solicit a patient. So as a result, the state has not enforced this. And I think a lot of doctors have gotten into bad habits and really pushed the edges of uh, uh, this statute, if not crossed the line very clearly, into providing and paying kickbacks. If and when the state decides that they want to enforce this statute, that's going to cause a problem for a number of, of doctors who are going to have to change their practice. And certainly the doctors who are out on the leading edge are going to be the first ones to be prosecuted. That's going to be a very uncomfortable situation for them to be in. These two news releases from the Department of Justice help explain why the government cares about kickbacks. Essentially, the government wants decisions about medical care to not be influenced by who's going to provide the best kickback. Doctors making referrals should make decisions based on what is best for the patient, not on what is going to result in the best payment to them. Uh, these press releases, uh, first two are a couple of examples of kickback schemes. The first one is pretty obvious. The chiropractor was paid a cash fee per patient he referred to the pain management physician. And by the way, the amount of cash would vary depending upon the type of insurance and what treatment would be rendered. The second one is not quite as clear. The chiropractor advertised for a free consultation. Now, the argument on the government side is that a free consultation will encourage patients to seek care when they may not really need it or to seek or to incur an expense that may not necessary may not be necessary. And if they have to pay for that service, then they're going to be less likely to take advantage of it. The other thing the doctor did was to offer to waive copays or provide patients with free dinners. Now, in and of themselves, I think these are fairly innocuous seeming practices, but the federal government, the U.S. Attorney's Office, has very clearly taken the position that they are a violation of the kickback statute or the federal kickback statute. Um, now, there is an exception for nominal gifts. Uh, general rule on kickbacks is you can't pay anything of value. There are a number of exceptions, and I'm not going to try to go through all the safe harbors or exceptions that exist, other than to say that small gifts are not prohibited. Uh, Office of Inspector General has said if the retail value of the gift is less than $15 per item, less than $75 in the aggregate per patient per year, then that's not a gift that they would pursue or, or prosecute as a kickback. Uh, the gifts should not be or cannot be cash or cash equivalents. So it's one thing to give somebody a small token of your appreciation, it's something else to give them a $10 bill. Um, be careful. I think a lot, again, I think a lot of doctors in Texas have developed some bad habits uh, that would violate this statute if the state goes about trying to enforce it. Another example of fraud is failing to disclose your bill to a patient. If you think about it for a minute, if a doctor is expecting to be paid for a service, there really is no reason why the doctor would not share the fees with the patient. And the only explanation that I can think of why a doctor wouldn't disclose that information 
is because the doctor is engaging in some kind of insurance fraud and doesn't want the patient to be aware of it. Now, by the way, if you happen to be thinking about that kind of fraud, the insurance company will send an explanation of benefits to your patient. That EOB is going to disclose exactly what you charged and what you charged them for. So that you're not going to be able to keep this a secret from the patient anyway. But the Texas Board has a regulation first that says if the patient requests uh, the charges, the doctor must provide it and can be disciplined for grossly unprofessional conduct if they fail to provide it. In addition, there's another rule that says on the day the doctor provides the goods or services, the doctor must disclose to the patient in writing the full amount of the doctor's charges. So as you set your office up, you set your practice up, you need to think about how you can set procedures in place so that the patient can be provided with a bill on their way out of your office after every visit. I also think it's a good practice to have the patient sign the uh, statement uh, or sign a, a statement on, the, on your invoice that acknowledges that they received the services billed for on that invoice. That helps avoid arguments down the road where the patient may have forgotten about all the extra services you provided by having them sign it on that day, on the day of the visit, before they leave your office. And if there's something they didn't receive that's on the bill, either the bill can be corrected or if they need the service, it helps the doctor double check to make sure they provide the service they should be providing. Dual fee schedules, I think, provide a lot of confusion or the source of a lot of confusion. The statute in Texas basically says you cannot charge two different prices when you are charging the lower price because, or excuse me, the higher price because an insurance company is going to pay all or part of the claim. Now that statute is in the Texas Insurance Code. It's not directed towards chiropractors. It's not even directed towards healthcare professionals. So for example, a roofing company that changes the price to repair and replace a roof after a hailstorm, because they know after a hailstorm, the insurance companies are going to be paying for that service. Then, then those uh, uh, insurance companies are engaged in a dual fee schedule. Some doctors, some chiropractors, try to provide discounts for patients who pay cash. Their rationale is that because the patients are paying cash, it saves the doctor money in not having to process and prepare insurance claims and then wait for the insurance company to pay and then argue with the insurance company when they don't pay. While it's true that it saves the doctor a great deal of administrative expense when they receive cash instead of an insurance payment, the insurance companies lobbied for this statute to protect themselves. Now, it is permissible if a patient is indigent, a patient is poor, to either provide a lower cost or a discount for them because they are poor. It's also legal to provide discounts that are not based on insurance. So for example, if a chiropractor provides a discount for military veterans or for uh, uh, police and fire department personnel or host a patient appreciation day where they waive the fees for patients who come in on that particular day, or if there's a particular group that you offer a discount to, perhaps it's a, a club that you belong to or a church that you belong to, and anyone who belongs to that church receives some kind of discount on your fees. Those kinds of discounts are not illegal. They're permitted. The only time it becomes a problem is when it's a subterfuge to provide a discount for patients who are paying cash and to charge the poor defenseless insurance companies a higher price. So be careful about this in the way that you structure your fees so you don't run into problems with the dual fee schedule. The next type of fraud I want to talk about is waiving deductibles. Deductibles are in insurance policies. They're included in insurance policies. 
to make the patients conscious of what they are paying for and to encourage them to be thoughtful and not request unnecessary services. The American Medical Association explains this in one of their ethics opinions. They also make it clear that if there's a financial hardship, it's okay to waive the deductible, and that shouldn't be a violation of the law. The Department of Health and Human Services has issued special fraud alerts. Just kind of a quick comment about these. The Department of Health and Human Services has actually been very good at understanding or acknowledging that these rules are complicated. Doctors don't necessarily understand or focus on these rules. And what the department does is they publish special fraud alerts that tell doctors, here's something we are seeing happening in the marketplace. And we want to make you aware that we think there is a problem with this. The other thing the department does is to issue advisory opinions. If you have a particularly difficult question and you're willing to pay for their advice, you can ask the department to express an opinion about whether that would be a violation of the kickback statute. Now, there are limitations on what they can explain in those opinions. Uh, and certainly, if you want to pursue that process, that's a time to hire an attorney to help you do that. But the special fraud alert on copays is pretty clear. Uh, government says that routinely waiving Medicare deductibles and copayments uh, is being investigated, and it is unlawful because it may incur or cause false claims. In other words, the provider is billing Medicare as though they actually collected the deductible, even though they didn't. It may result in kickbacks because the provider is, is waiving the copay, giving something of value to the patient. It may also result in excessive utilization or unnecessary services because the patient is not being deterred or being encouraged to be thoughtful with that deductible being paid. So waiving copays is a problem. The special fraud alert is also very clear there is an exception for financial hardship. Now, there are some examples of cases that were prosecuted and what the government found is the provider or the hospital was finding that everybody was a financial hardship. So they were waiving the deductibles for virtually everybody. And if it's being used routinely, then that financial hardship exception is probably being abused. If you decide to use that exception, I think it's important to document that you are applying it and to document why you are applying it. It's not necessary, I don't think, for you to perform any kind of audit of the patient to confirm that there's financial hardship. I think you can ask the patient a few questions and assuming you don't have any suspicions about their truthfulness, I think you can rely upon what they're telling you. So if they're telling you they're on, on food stamps, you can rely on that and may decide to waive their, the deductible because of that. This is an advisory opinion, and I, I, I think this is kind of fun to look at because somebody actually took the time to submit a question of, okay, we're not going to really waive the deductibles, but what happens if we just decide to not pursue collection? We're going to charge the patient. They happen to pay great, but if they don't, we're not going to pursue any kind of collection activity. Not surprisingly, the government came back and said, you know what, we conclude that that arrangement is grounds for the imposition of criminal penalties as it relates to kickbacks. So don't uh, uh, don't charge waive don't charge deductibles and then effectively waive it by telling the patient you're not going to pursue collection of it. So one question that many people have about fraud, and I think the way a lot of doctors get caught up in fraud, is they start to commit it. They, they commit fraud a few times, you know, kind of put their toe in the waters, and they get away with it. It's kind of like speeding on the freeway. If the speed limit's 55 and you're going 56 or 57, you can go right by that police officer and he may not come after you, depending on the state you're in. But the uh, uh, 
Same thing happens with fraud. I think some doctors kind of try it out a little bit and figure out, okay, I got away with that. And then it becomes a bigger and bigger part of their practice until it becomes an issue. Now, the way the government catches fraud typically is from whistleblowers. Now, the False Claims Act is an interesting act. It was actually adopted during the Civil War. The uh, government, United States government, noticed that they were being billed for a lot more bullets and guns and horses and food than they were actually receiving. I suspect inventory control was a little bit different back in those years than it is today. So what the government did, because they, they couldn't be aware of everything at all places, is they created this statute that allows whistleblowers to file a lawsuit saying we are aware that someone is submitting a false claim to the government. If the government intervenes or if the lawsuit results in a recovery, the whistleblower then receives a portion of the recovery. Now this particular uh, slide summarizes a press release from the Department of Justice. And I'll tell you, they make the same press release. The numbers are different, but it's basically the same press release every year in November or December. What it tells you is they recovered $4.7 billion for fraud and false claims against the government in 2016. Of the $4.7 billion, $2.5 billion, that is more than half of it, came from the healthcare industry. And by the way, the $2.5 billion is only the federal recovery. Many of those also were associated with a recovery for the state Medicaid programs. The other thing that's interesting is this last point. Now, whistleblowers filed 702 key Tom suits. That's where they file the suit saying that somebody is filing a false claim, making a false claim for payment to the federal government. So in 2016, 702 of those cases were filed. That's about 13 a week. So that's a fair number of claims. And the department recovered nearly $3 billion in those cases in 2016 in one year. And the whistleblowers received a little more than $500 million during that same period. So the key here is to understand that the government is giving an incentive to your employees, to your patients, to your competitors, etc., to file a claim that you are making false claims against the government. And it's a financial incentive. So even if you commit fraud a few times and get away with it, at some point you're going to have someone get mad at you. You're going to fire an employee. And many, many of these cases are filed by former employees uh, who have become upset because they got fired. And this is a great way for them to get uh, a little bit of revenge against the person who fired them. So think carefully about who else knows what's going on before you even think about committing insurance fraud. Uh, it's simply not possible. It's not practical in this day and age to engage in any kind of fraudulent scheme and have, have it be not known to anybody else. Other people are going to know about it, and sooner or later, one of those other people is going to be incentivized to go and file a whistleblower claim against you. Now, at this point, I want to show you a few things about the Office of Inspector General's website. Uh, the government, like I mentioned, understands that these rules are complicated. Uh, they actually have a pretty good website. The Office of Inspector General is the Office of the Attorneys. These are the attorneys who enforce the uh, fraud and, and uh, Medicare and Medicaid rules. So if you're committing a kickback scheme, these are the folks who will come out and prosecute you. I will tell you, in my general experience, they are very good lawyers, certainly much better than some of the prosecutors you may see at the county level. Uh, these are good lawyers. This is a top-notch job for lawyers. Uh, the website has a, a very simply the uh, uh, 
address for the website is oig.hhs.gov. And once you get to that website, you can find all kinds of information. I think some of the better information first under this. Actually, let me point out a couple things on this home page. There's a nice, simple link. If you want to report fraud, if you decide you want to be one of those whistleblowers, of course, you can't report yourself. But if you need to report somebody else, it's very simple to click here and that will give you information about how to report it. The other piece you ought to be aware of is if you are hiring employees, you should check to see if they are excluded from providing care for the patients covered by Medicare and Medicaid. And this exclusions database can help you make that search very easily. Under the tab for reports and publications, the uh, uh, they provide a number of publications. The one that I usually find most interesting is this work plan. Once a year, they will publish a plan that tells you exactly what kinds of things they are looking at. So for example, as a chiropractor, you may want to click on the work plan link. And they've now got it all online. So when you go to the work plan, you can go to uh, recently added items, which are the newest items, the active items that they're working on, or you can go to an archive to look at the plans from previous years. So if you're trying to figure out what they're looking at today, I would look at the active work plan items. So for example, if you're trying to figure out what they're looking for in the chiropractic profession, you can search very easily for chiropractic and you can see they're looking at Medicare payments for uncovered or non-covered services. And they also have another report on uh, Part B payments. And I will tell you essentially what their primary concern is, uh, is that active care treatment of a condition is being billed, or excuse, I've got that backwards. Maintenance care, preventative care, is being billed as though it were active care, treatment of a condition or an injury. Medicare will provide some coverage for active care, but it provides no coverage for preventive chiropractic care. So be careful about how you document your claims. Be careful about how you categorize them so you don't expose yourself to an investigation. The uh, fraud tab at the top of the page as this tab on enforcement actions. If you uh, uh, kind of like reading about the car wrecks or watching the news about car wrecks and other bad things, this is a great place for you to go. Uh, for example, you can look at criminal and civil enforcement and it gives you all the press releases that they've, uh, uh, for prosecutions, they've, they've uh, uh, either agreements or prosecutions that they've engaged in. So for example, I'm recording this on July 7th and already in the month of July, we've got four press releases there. Um, you can certainly look at those and each one is its own example of a car wreck. The compliance tab at the top of the page has a couple things underneath it. One is the compliance 101 tab. This actually has some good videos and some good materials that are designed for healthcare providers, for doctors. The information is written and designed for laypersons to understand what's prohibited by the rules and to help them come into compliance with the rules. If you're just not familiar with these rules at all and you're looking for a good starting point, this is a great place to go. It's a great place to go for a refresher to make sure you're not forgetting about something. The other thing under this tab, under the Compliance tab, are the Special Fraud Alerts, Bulletins, and other guidance. So for example, I showed you a minute ago the Special Fraud Alert on the waiver of deductibles. That's old enough that I don't think it's on this page anymore. Oh, there it is right there actually, at the bottom of the page. Uh, but it also has the uh, bulletins that they publish from time to time and it has other guidance statements that they provide. And I think this is a good idea to look at. They don't publish these very often, but a few times a year they will publish things that tell you this is something we are 
alerted to, something we're looking at, something we've either started to investigate or will start to investigate. And that tells you if you were engaged in any of those practices, this is the warning sign. This is kind of like the policeman on the side of the road with the radar gun. This is the warning sign that you need to check your speedometer and make sure the way that you're running your practice. Okay, here's a statement about gifts of nominal value. So if you're making small gifts to your patients, you might want to make a, take a look at that and make sure you are providing benefits or providing gifts that are not going to trigger the kickback statute. The other thing that I think is interesting is your uh, practice grows and you start to add some employees is to go look at the corporate integrity agreements. Uh, basically what they've done here is the corporate integrity agreement is usually part of a settlement and it usually imposes a lot of burdens on the provider to confirm that they are not in violation and to make sure they continue to comply. You can get some good ideas if you go back and look at the specific agreements. Um, now these are not easy to read and they are long. Okay, here's one that's 30 pages long. But it goes through some of the requirements that the uh, provider's going to be required to do to make sure they're, they're staying in compliance. And that may give you some ideas or suggestions for how you can run your practice a little bit better or more in compliance. So again, the basic web page here is oig.hhs.gov. So I just want to take a few minutes here to, to go walk through a few of the press releases we've talked about. This is that annual press release that talks about how much money they recover. Again, this year for 2016, they recovered $4.7 billion, $2.5 billion from the healthcare industry, and the whistleblowers received $500 million. Pretty strong incentive. Here's another example of a settlement from about a week ago. The uh, uh, case was started by a whistleblower. Government didn't do any investigation. There's no search warrant. There's no police investigation, no police interview. The whistleblower, who happened to be a former employee, reports and files this lawsuit to start the process running. Settlement in this case is $5.5 million. The lady who filed the lawsuit alleges she lost her job as an oncology nurse. So in addition to whatever she received from settling her employment claim, she's also going to get a 26% share of the $5.5 million settlement. So that's what, a little more than a million dollars that should, uh, or $1.5 million, that should help quite a bit. Uh, another example of a whistleblower case, the allegation in this case involved upcoding. The uh, uh, Again, this was started as the result of a whistleblower, and there was a $4.2 million settlement. Government enjoys going after these cases. As, as someone who works in the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, it's always good for their, their resume or to help them move up the ladder to show that they're bringing money into the government. These cases cost very little to investigate, they're usually after hospitals and, and insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and doctors who are making some money, people who can pay fairly large settlements. And because they can pay those large settlements, they actually collect the money and it costs very little to get it. So from a, the perspective of somebody working in the U.S. Attorney's Office, these cases are great cases to, to handle. Uh, this case is a little bit older. It, it involved a $25 million settlement. Uh, it involved upcoding in a neonatology practice. Um, this press release explains a little bit about how the Civil False Claims Act came about. Uh, and it also tells you the whistleblower in this case, out of the $25 million award, the whistleblower will receive almost $1.6 million. So again, that's a pretty strong incentive. And last comment I'll make about the False Claims Act is to remind you that Lance Armstrong was caught. And the reason he got exposed was because one of his teammates 
uh, a teammate who was shunned, Floyd Landis, filed a whistleblower lawsuit under the False Claims Act. This is one of the special advisory bulletins that I just wanted to bring to your attention. A lot of practices use business consultants or consultants to help with the billing in the practice. And essentially what the government says in this uh, uh, bulletin is that, you know, most, most of those consultants are honest and provide a valuable and legitimate business service, but there's a few of them that are unscrupulous. And when you're choosing who you're going to work with, you need to pay attention to what they're telling you and how they're acting. And if they're doing things that are, even though they may not be illegal, if they're doing things that cause questions about their, their ethics, you probably need to be dealing with somebody else. Uh, some things you ought to be looking at is first, whether they're making illegal rep mis misrepresentations. Are they lying to you to get your business? If they're saying Medicare requires their seminars or that their program is recommended by the government or the OIG or by Medicare, government doesn't do any of those things. Um, so if they're using the government as backing for their business, you probably need to stay away from them because they're not showing themselves to be very honest. Pay attention to the promises or guarantees that they make. Some of these consultants come in and they make promises. For example, they promise that your billing will go up by a specific dollar amount or a percentage increase. That's a red flag. Uh, without looking at your billing records, how could they possibly know how much it will go up? And if they've promised a certain percentage, they may feel some compulsion to engage in bad practices, illegal practices, to try to get up to that, to that uh, percentage or amount. If they encourage abusive practices, for example, if they encourage you to use inappropriate billing codes, I'm not really going to talk about billing codes in this class because I don't have time, but make sure you understand the billing codes that are appropriate for chiropractic care. Use the proper codes. Make sure you understand when different codes should be used. It's not a good idea just to use a code because you know the insurance company will pay it. The code needs to reflect the exact service provided to the patient. Uh, they may also encourage abusive practices such as billing for expensive items or services when a lesser item is actually being provided. Uh, so pay attention to uh, any uh, uh, abusive practices that are encouraged. Also pay attention if the consultant is discouraging compliance efforts, uh, if they're trying to discourage self audits, for example. Those kinds of things should be par for the course. Uh, be careful about the consultants that you use. So that's a very brief discussion about insurance fraud. Certainly, as you get into the, de the details, there's a lot more information there. Uh, for example, about the exceptions to the kickback statute. But uh, uh, general idea is you need to be careful about how you bill your patients. Be careful about compensation that you pay. And make sure you're paying compensation for appropriate services. Make sure your documentation is kept accurately and that your coding is appropriate for the service that you actually provide.